Capcom Section Z for the NES circa 1987, a modified rendition of its original 85 arcade counterpart. Before we get on with this, as usual, I'm dedicating this latest review to Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, Link Community TV, Cambridge Community TV, Arlington Community Media, Belmont Media Center, Bit Bar Salem, 16 Bit Heroes, Chavez Slovakia, The Mount Vernon Kid, Blasphemous HD, MIT, Harvard, Kenzie Bach, Born Best Pizza from Wretches Radio and Antisocial Conditioning, The Letterman Family, Voxney, Old School Gamer Mama, Mario B. And Nicole, Jay Shetty, Darman Studios, We're Not Just Telling Stories or Changing Lives, and finally, Blast Processing Video Games. With these out of our system, onto this game's main premise. Taking place in an unknown year of the third millennium, a space station that's been orbiting the Earth appears, within which the secret base of an alien empire by the name of Balangul is housed. A dedicated, fully trained space ranger, despite having no name in either the original arcade version or the Japanese Famicom Disk System variant. Here, he's renamed Captain Commando for some bizarre reason, who for the record, was the US mascot for the majority of Capcom's earliest NES releases, until his true, much-deserved makeover in the 91 arcade beat-em-up inspired by Final Fight, who would then later make appearances in Marvel vs. Capcom 1 and 2, but I digress. It's sent to infiltrate said base in question, and neutralize both it, and its artificial living body, L-Brain, thereby restoring peace throughout the universe, or lack thereof. As far as gameplay, akin to, if nowhere near Capcom's other shmup classics, including Vulgus, 1942, and later 43, 41, 44, Double X, not to mention Exodexes, aka Savage Bees, and even more to the point, a few of its successors including Sidearms, Forgotten Worlds, and the like, make that more like the bastard child of either of the latter two, and Nintendo's Metroid. You're put in control of the quote-unquote almost humanoid astronaut, as he begins his long journey through the Balangul base starting from the cosmos, As you're bound to discover, every single interior base area travels horizontally, unlike the original arcade parent, which also features varying vertical base areas, and at varying speeds depending on your headway no less. While the D-pad lets him migrate of his own accord, and of course yours, BNA allows him to concentrate his laser firepower to the left and right individually, unlike in the arcade variation where you're provided one button to fire, and another to alternate your aiming perspective. Select allows him to shift his special weaponry and or items, and pushing both B and A simultaneously summons one of his special transmission shell weapons, or STS for short. Cases in point, the Mega Missile, Flash Bomb, and or the Crush Ball, at the cost of four energy points. In which other case, I'd use at my own goddamn risk. Apart from the numerous special weapons you'll be discovering throughout the base, other frequent items to keep in mind are speed boosters and energy refill capsules. Speaking of, in the true fashion of the aforementioned Metroid, a life counter is displayed above, indicating how much you've got remaining before kissing the canvas, out of 20 I might add. Should you happen to endure way too much firing damage at any juncture, let alone collide with any adversary, which results in having 5 energy points deducted upon respawning, it's your ass. However, you'll end up being banished all the way back to the fucking cosmos, or the start of later major areas, starting at sections 20 and 40, if your energy drains completely, despite the game not ending instantaneously. And while we're on the subject of how heavily this takes after Metroid, the entire maze is randomized and numbered, that you'll always be faced with two choices of areas to warp to next, either one or two sections ahead, one section back, or, isn't it obvious, certain goddamn death. Hence the quote-unquote red transporter beam, which will result in the latter fate, unless you've met a specific goal beforehand. And what goal might I be getting at, one might ask? Discovering and eradicating the shit out of a nearby sub-boss generator found somewhere within the first chain of interior asteroid base sections, and then seeking out and doing the same to all the rest before reaching Galbrain and its prior guardians, of course. Accomplish these key tasks, and your main energy reserve will be further expanded, thereby making yourself almost invincible, considering the damage penalties that were recounted earlier, coupled with the arbitrary-ass hitbox, I might add, and the often comforting fact that the generators are still out of commission every time you restart. In spite of it all, however, I wouldn't, in the very least, expect this fucking game to suck my cock, cause it'll tear that shit right off and feed it to the alligator that bit off Chubbs' hand in Happy Gilmore and make you its filthy ass bitch in 1 50th of a nanosecond. 
In other words, Section Z is hard as balls, and you'll need much more than an exceptional, sugar-happy set of thumbs, razor-sharp reflexes, and an adventurous iron mind to conquer this intense son of a bitch. At least the controls are solid and straightforward in spite of how exhausting and monotonous they could be at times, and as much of a convoluted ass mind rape as the gameplay framework is, not to mention its key strategic system regarding the always pondering task of figuring out which of the two possible teleportation paths to take at the end of every base interior. In clear as day reality, it's nothing short of innovative and a true cakewalk to grasp, but let's not hold our breath quite yet. Concerning Section Z's challenge, aside from the controls, about which won't be recapped at this point, various other aspects that make this game a major ball buster include, but sure as fucking shit aren't limited to, the arbitrary enemy patterns and the unexpected slew of arbitrary twists, turns and hazards your bounty experience as often as getting shitfaced before performing any dangerous, professional level stunt, in real life as it were. On the former, there's an assload of confrontation hurdles involving forcing yourself to deal with said adversaries. Whether made up of mecha following your ass around constantly in a slow-moving section, numerous rows of spacecraft closing in on or circling around near your ass while spewing shitloads of bullets to and fro, or numerous other assortments of alien adversaries tying in with the themes of later quarters, and the latter involving having to invoke a serious deal of trial and error to not only evade every common cause of death, including but not limited to having your ass unexpectedly crushed between the screen edge and the landscape edge no less but also finding every important path within this topsy-ass, turvy-ass asteroid labyrinth to approach those earlier stated section generator sub-bosses, not to mention the few massive alien and mechanical lifeforms you'll be facing at the end of each chain of sections, and even return to certain interior corridors to obtain any special items, enhancements, and or weapons you might have inadvertently missed out on, or temporary secret warp zones containing them. And to top it all off, whenever you attempt to swap around or fuse your secondary weapons, namely the Mega Smasher and the Flash Buster, your chances of exposing yourself to imminent extreme damage are higher than the Eiffel, Leaning Pisa, and Tokyo Tower stacked together. That is, unless you've discovered the Barrier Shield, which, by the way, absorbs a shitload of damage until it vanishes, akin to Konami's Gradius and Life Force. Thank god there are infinite continues provided, regardless of how many lives you've got remaining, despite the obvious lack of a save feature, which for the record, was originally implemented in the aforementioned Japanese Famicom Disk System variation. Like, what the shit fucking Christ, Capcom? Either way, there's no shame in making every effort feasible to take these and many other elements into account to ensure a seamless exploration shmup experience. And don't think I forgot to remind everyone to either A, draw out a map from scratch, or B, refer to a pre-designed one online, neither of which constitute as cheating for fuck's sake. On the graphical forefront, while they don't appear to be anything mind-blowing nowadays, even for a Capcom shmup hailing from the same year as the first fucking Mega Man I might add, the overall visual aspects are at the very least tolerable and adequate, if at times repetitious as hell, specifically the Cosmos and all the varying Balangul asteroid-based interior corridors, its outer reaches, the frozen ventilation and duct areas, and barren-ass rock, magma, and bioorganic extraterrestrial caverns. The character designs of the main astronaut are dynamic beyond imagination, both in-game and during every intertwining cutscene, namely the demo, starting intro, transitioning between the major section areas, and of course the very end. While all the different enemies, as convincing as some appear to be, look like total pussy-ass bitches and leave so goddamn much to be desired, it's not even the least bit hilarious, with the probable exception of the section generator sub-bosses and maybe the giant mechanic and alien lifeforms, of course. Music and sound-wise, composed by Kumi Yamaga of 1943 and 1943 Kai on arcade fame, and Tamayo Kawamoto, that is before Ghouls and Ghosts, and even joining Taito's in-house band Zuntata, alongside Hiroshike Tonomura of DuckTales fame, will many find the diverse selection of themes far from uplifting and authentic? I'm officially going on record, and I'm more than certain some may have expected this, stating the exact goddamn opposite. Starting from the opening title and demo, and upon kicking off the Lonely Astronauts, aka the Pseudo-Captain Commandos, arduous galactic caper, hauling ass, or hovering ass in this particular case, through every asteroid base corridor, and exploring to his heart's content while keeping every extraterrestrial and mechanical shit-slurping fuckbait jerk-off at bay. Regarding the sound effects, as ever, I wish I could say the exact same about them, considering the console's limitations at the time, as they extremely drone over the themes too fucking often, Limited as the replayability is, considering the absence of any battery backup save and or password features, amongst this game's multitude of setbacks, about which I'm in no position to recap again, every potential full-blown strategy-infused playthrough should be more than a fighting chance to ensure the overall safety and success of its main astronaut hero, and then some. In addition, notwithstanding that it's been ignorantly cast the fuck aside in favor of other later and well-known titles of the era, due to the plain fact that it wasn't a traditional point A to point B arcade shmup like how it was originated two years prior, you'd be not shit in Compass Mentis to pass up Section Z.
Therefore, what's my final verdict? Your level of mileage and defiance might vary concerning this game. You might enjoy it, then again you might not. Also, forgive the quote-unquote double standard mannerism in advance, but while many may still turn away from, scorn, or otherwise detest it today, very few, if a much more sizable minority or majority, depending on how one desires to perceive this ordeal, just may happen to enjoy the ever-loving shit out of it. But thank god I'm not the only one concerning the latter. Anyhow, for all the shmup addicts and adventure junkies out there, looking at you again, Ian from 16-Bit Heroes, I low-key, flat-out recommend getting my ass out there and giving Section Z a whirl or two. Pricing-wise, a loose copy should run you between 4 to 5 bucks, to about as high as a mind-blowing 320 bucks. And let me assure you, absolutely no bullshitting here, there should be no ounce of lament experiencing what this exploration shmup has to offer. Until then, my all-is-faithful pack, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.